All right, how many of you had a good Christmas? Raise your hands. Good Christmas. Oh, man, like 100%. Very good. Very nice. How many of you got a gift for Christmas? Anybody? Give gifts for Christmas. Okay. Um, best Christmas gift. What did you get? What, just yell it out at me. What was something you got that you loved? A kitten. A kitten. Okay. That would not be one for me, but okay. Good job, Garrett. <laughs> Guitar, case. Guitar case. Okay. Snow boots, very appropriate for you to wear today, yes. What else? Money. Money, oh. How many of that well, you would say that's your favorite? Money's a good one, right? Money's a great one because uh, the next question was this. Did anybody get anything that was used or recycled? Money doesn't count because that's always recycled, right? Anybody get a gift that was used or recycled? You know, years ago, Seinfeld did the whole episode on re-gifting, kind of brought that word into the vernacular, which was great. Nobody got a used gift this year or a recycled gift this year. You know, it's very popular nowadays, going to the flea markets or wherever, and you find a piece of furniture, and you redo it, and you make it pretty, and, you know, you restore it, and all that fun stuff. Um, that's a big trend right now, recycling and all that, which is great, furniture and houses, clothes and all that. But I think we would all agree that there are some things that we just wouldn't want used. Could we agree on that? What are some things that you think you just wouldn't want used? Luke's got something in his mind because I see him laughing already and he's not going to say it. He's like, it's not appropriate for Sunday morning, right, Luke? <laughs> what somebody say? Deodorant. deodorant. Oh, that's a good one. Anybody here want used deodorant? I've gotten that gift oh, you've, you've gotten that gift before. Was it a white elephant? Was it a white elephant? Okay, that's good. White elephant, great gift. What else would you not want used? Oh, very, yes. I'm not even going to ask how many of you would use somebody else's toothbrush. I don't want to dis- I don't want to think that poorly of you. So, what else would you not want used? Underwear. Underwear. It's a good one. I don't want somebody else's underwear. I'm with you. Anything else? What would you not want used? You guys are good. You've like hit most of my list. Toilet paper, that's a good one too. That's a gross one. Yes. Somebody, I, I found, somebody said Q-tips. Don't want anybody to use Q-tips. That's just gross, isn't it? Um, dental floss was also mentioned. Don't want that used. Uh, some guy I was, I was reading said, actually, I don't want used toilets. So like when he bought a house, he went in and like the first thing he did was replaced all the toilets. That's a little extreme, I think. Weird maybe, but... Uh, So we can all agree that there are some things that we just don't want used. And really, the the reason I ask that question is because as we begin a new year, I know for me, and maybe I'm weird, um, how many of you are like me, though? Let me ask this. When you think about January 1 of a new year, there's something psychological that happens to you where you think, oh, new year, fresh start. Anybody like me or is that just me? Okay, a few. Some of you are like, just another day, right? Just keep the calendar running. Okay. Um, I don't know what it is, but for me, as I begin a new year, I kind of think, okay, how is life going to be different? What happened last year? What do I want to, to be different this year? How am I going to move into a new year? And really, that's what we wanted to think about as we kicked off this new year with a new series. As you can see, we're calling it All Things New, Joining God in the Renewal of all things. And, you know, we've established in the past uh, that this church right here is not a resolutions church. We don't make New Year's resolutions. We've asked before, and you guys are like, no, those are dumb. But as I said, it is a new year, and we want you to be thinking this direction. What maybe does God have in store for us in 2022? Now, I know that we hoped that 2021 would not be the same gut punch that 2020 seemed to be, but evidently 2021 came in and said, here, 2020, hold my beer, and let's see what I can do on top of this. Um, But we all do know, and I know this, even though psychologically things are happening, nothing magically happens. It's, we almost had that th- mentality last year, 2021's coming and COVID's just going to disappear. And we found out not only did it not disappear, it came back raging multiple times. Um, it doesn't re- the new year doesn't remove difficulties. It doesn't remove the challenges. We're still facing the same things today on January, what is today, January 2nd, as we were December 31st. However, I do believe if we're willing to pause and do an introspective look, it can be a healthy thing. And it can be healthy for us, and it can lead to maybe some things that we need to modify 
to some healing that we need in our lives and hopefully lead to wholeness. And so that's where we begin today is we're going to talk about personal renewal, personal renewal. That's where it begins with us. The Apostle Paul often talked about this renewal of the person. In fact, one of the letters that we're going to look at today, he wrote to a church in Corinth, and he addresses some of their wrong thinking. Now, 2 Corinthians is very interesting because it's Paul having to kind of defend himself to the people. He had launched this church, started this church. He was the apostle that was there. And then, he, of course, if you read 1 Corinthians, you see they kind of had all these different issues and disunity and sin and things, and Paul's having to address it. And then by the time he writes the, 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 the letter we have as 2 Corinthians, we understand that they've even kind of pushed him out and pushed him aside, and they're challenging his authority. And, and the reason they're doing this is because as they look at what it means to have faith and what it looks to mean to, to live and, and follow Jesus, it doesn't look or feel like what they think it should look or feel like. I mean, to be fair, even Jesus wasn't who they thought he should be. Because when they talked about the Messiah, they were looking for somebody different. They wanted somebody with power and strength. And when they looked at the apostle who they were following, you had Paul who's getting in trouble and being beaten and being thrown in jail. And, you know, he, he's having all this difficulty. And they're like, yeah, but if you're really following Jesus, shouldn't there be, you know, roses and buttercups all the time? And shouldn't life just be easygoing? Isn't that what this faith is all about? And then so... Paul addresses some of these things, and he talks to them about what this personal renewal looks like. And so it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read just a portion of this, starting at verse 14. And here's what we find here. So Paul writes, he says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. So the one who died was Jesus, and he died for all. And he died for all, that those who should live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, now on, uh, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. And this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed uh, to us the message of reconciliation. I love that passage. Such a powerful passage. In fact, if you look at what Paul says about us when he says, if anyone is in Christ... They are the new creation has come. Literally, if you look at the Greek, it's even shorter than that. It's like it says, if anyone in Messiah, if anyone in Messiah, new creation. That's what the Greek says. Very short, very to the point. Anyone in Christ, new creation. N.T. Wright calls this verse one of the best summaries of what Christianity is all about. You see, what we see here is that just as in the beginning, Genesis 1, as God spoke and created all that is, the world where we live, the universe is beyond what we can see. Just as God creates all this, he also recreates. He also renews. He restores. He makes new. And when he restores and when he renews, life as we know it isn't the same. He does something within us that redefines who we are. He redefines all the things that might have, have labeled us in the past, and he gives us something new. You see, the way we live, so often we are defined by what we do. In fact, most of the time when we talk to people, what's our first or second question out of our mouths? Maybe it's, what's your name? And the second one is, what do you do? Because that is what defines us. And if it's not what we do that defines us, it's what we've done that can possibly define us. And that can get us even into more trouble because we can have these labels that we carry with us. I mean, just thank God a lot of us were able to escape high school, right? Because we get rid of some of those labels and those things that people placed on us. And so we can be defined by our, the things we do. We can be defined by these worldly labels. But here what Paul is saying is, no. The God who creates and the God who restores and the God who renews all things, we are now redefined, not by the things we do, not by the job we hold, but now we're defined by our relationship with God through Jesus. That is the defining thing. Because if anyone in Messiah, new creation, new, restored, 
Isn't that amazing? I mean, it would be tempting for us, though, to think about this in a couple of wrong ways. I think we can think about this in, in a wrong way and thinking, oh, it's, it's just a feeling. It's a feeling. Well, I feel renewed. I feel like I'm something different. You know, I come to church. I sing some nice songs about Jesus. I hear a message about God, and I leave, and I feel a little better about myself. But it's more than a feeling. What, what Paul is talking about, what Jesus does within us is not just get, make you feel happy. It's not just more than a feeling. It's more than just a state of mind, too. We might be tempted to fall into this category that says, you know, just, just change your thinking. Think positive. Think good things. You know, I thought back to that old Saturday Night Live sketch, Stuart Smalley. You guys remember that? Looking at the mirror, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. This is not what we're talking about. This is garbage. The transformation and the renewal that comes about is not just a feeling. It's not just a, a positive state of mind that we're talking about. It's beyond that. Because if we, if we reduce what Jesus has done to that, we miss the fullness of what Christ came to do. We don't understand what happened in the beginning. Go back with me. Genesis chapter 1, what happened? We have this beautiful story of God speaking and God creating. And after everything he says, he says, and it was good. good. And then you come to chapter 3, that stinking chapter 3, where you find Adam and Eve in the garden, and God says, everything is for your use and benefit except for this one tree. Don't, don't eat it. And what do they do? They just can't help themselves. They're tempted. They move in. They eat. And we see the beautiful creation of God is broken. The unending relationship that we had with God, that unbroken, that constant communion we had with God was ruined and destroyed. God's beautiful creation thrown off track. And you see, what we view about Genesis there shapes what we view about what Paul is talking about here. Because if we look at Adam and Eve and their sin is no big deal, if we see that, ah, oh, it's just a minor little slip up, then we will come away from what Paul is saying and go, well, then it's not a big deal for us. We just need some tweaks and some modifications. But if we understand the destructive power and the nature of sin in our lives, we see that we need not just tweaks, we need to be resurrected. We are dead in sin and we need to be brought back to life. We need a complete redo. A Band-Aid won't do. I mean, just look at how the Bible refers to sin. It talks about the wages of sin is death. That's some serious stuff. And when we die, no good feeling, no amount of positive thinking is going to change that fact that we are dead. And neither will it change our spiritual condition. And good for us that even though we can't fix ourselves, what Paul tells us here is that the solution has already been addressed in Jesus. And what Paul is saying here is that he's talking about this all-encompassing, all-embracing, life-transforming event. That when we come to Christ, that when we are in Christ, everything is reoriented in such a way that we will never be the same again. This is a new birth that's available to us. In fact, you go back to John chapter 3 when Jesus is interacting with, with one of the religious leaders, Nicodemus. And Jesus describes it that way as a new birth. You must be born again. And I realize in our culture that that terminology may evoke emotions in us. And we're like, oh, I don't like that expression. But Jesus used it. There's some good pictures there that we get that we must be born again. A spiritual birth that's brought about by the Holy Spirit of God. We are made brand new. The old is gone. And we have new life and what Paul wants us to understand is that this new life has some incredible benefits. Some incredible things happen to us when we find that we are a new creation. And the first one is just simply this. We get a new start. We get a new start. We don't have to be defined by our past mistakes, our failures. We don't even have to be defined by our past successes. Isn't that amazing? I mean, in our culture, we love to live on past success, right? But then what happens is we feel like, oh my goodness, we did that well. The next time I have to do even better. 
and we get on this unending treadmill, or let's talk about our mistakes, or let's don't talk about our mistakes. Because who wants to be defined by the, the biggest regrets that we have in our life? And Paul is saying here, guess what? You get a do-over. Anybody want to do over sometimes? Man, a restart. And regardless of how good or how bad our life may have been, we have the potential for new life in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Now, I will tell you, doesn't mean the consequences of sin or the things we've done in the past magically disappear. That doesn't happen. We still have to live with those things. But instead of struggling with those things on your own, you know what new life means? It means that we are going through those things with Jesus day after day. He's with us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we have a community, a family that can surround us and love us and support us through that. Because as I said earlier, this is not an individual faith. It's the presence and the power of Christ that will forgive you. Let me say that again. It's the presence and the power of Christ that will forgive you. And it also gives you the ability, the power to forgive others for what has been done to you. Whatever we were once involved in, we can move beyond it. The hurt that we have caused or that others have caused to us, the people we've stepped on to get where we've wanted to be, the gossip we've shared, whatever it might be, the power and the presence of Christ moves us beyond that. And we no longer have to be defined by that. It will give us victory over sin. Isn't that amazing? We no longer have to be victims. The lust we struggle with, the apathy we have towards the needs of others, the pride and selfishness we may have, we're no longer in bondage to that. Jesus Christ comes and he makes us new. And we can release things like the bitterness and the anger and the unforgiveness and the hopelessness. You can release it all because you are made new. Does that excite anybody? Does that make you feel good? That you don't have to be locked in to something that was, that Paul is telling you, hey, in Christ, new creation, new. How many of us want to feel and be that new that Paul is talking about? And if, I, and if we ended that message right here, That'd be a great message, wouldn't it? I mean, that's encouraging and uplifting. And man, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. But Paul goes on. He says it's not just, not just a fresh start, a new start. He says there's something else. He says you get a new outlook on life. Look at verse 16 again. Paul says, so from now on, we regard no one from the worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in the same way, we do so no longer. When we are made new, we're no longer limited to the vision that we've always seemed to have had to see things as they were or how they are, even how they might be. You see, this was an issue for the Corinthian church, as I said earlier. When they thought of Jesus, in the beginning they came to Jesus and that said, great, we love the Messiah. But as false teachers rose up, they began to say things to them like, yeah, but would a real Messiah be so weak? Would a real Messiah die on a cross? And they began to challenge that idea. And would a real prophet, would a real apostle be somebody that's thrown in jail? That doesn't sound like an apostle. I mean, an apostle would be somebody with power and somebody that changed things. And look at Paul. He's so weak. And Paul's saying, look, stop looking at things from the wrong perspective. You don't have to be limited to your worldly perspective to see how things are or how things might can be. I mean, we can view things differently. You don't have to be the strongest, be the most powerful to surround ourselves with power players and influential types. What did Jesus do? He surrounded himself with the dregs of society, the outcast. He had no money to support his movement. These people that were around him had no influence. And in the end, these were the people that deserted Jesus. Look at Jesus. He died on a cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. From a human perspective, Jesus was probably seen as the biggest fraud in the history of creation. But when we're a new creation, we don't look at it through those eyes, do we? How do we see Jesus now? Well, we see him resurrected, risen, the Lord, our Lord, our Savior. He is the hope of the world. And for us as a new creation, we have a new outlook. We can see things with new eyes because everything will not just look different. And that's what I want you to understand. It's not just because we, we put on rose-colored glasses and it's like, oh, no, everything's great. No, it shifts our perspective. Things are truly different. 
We don't just see Jesus differently, we see others different. We see them, we won't see that we are better than them. We'll see them through the eyes of Christ and be moved with compassion to love and to serve. And even beyond just the physical, how things might actually be, we can see with eyes of faith what God can do. No situation will be hopeless. No situation will be outside of what the power of God can reach. And this new outlook gives us a new hope, a new hope in what God can do. Paul highlights one other thing, though. We don't just have a new start. We don't just have a new outlook. But then we also get a new purpose, a new purpose. We have a new mission. Look at verse 18. Paul says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting the people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You become little Jesuses in the world. I love that idea. What Jesus Christ came to do, he's saying, hey, I want you to be involved with as well. And think about that word reconciliation. What does that word imply? Relationship. We reconcile relationally. God has reconciled mankind, humanity to himself. And we are being invited in. When we are a new creation, Jesus is looking and saying, I want you to go into the world and do what I have done for you with the world. Reconcile. It's a good churchy word, right? Bridging over those quarrels, breaking down the divides. And before we go, well, why would I want to do that? I just want to live my life comfortably. Again, go back to the beginning. Let's see the huge divide that existed between us and God that had to be spanned. You know, the Bible describes us before new creation, enemies of God. Not that God, let's correct something here. It wasn't that God was looking at us going, you're my enemy, you're my enemy, you're my enemy, and I hate you. Let's flip that around. We were the ones looking at God. And God, I won't have anything to do with you. You're my enemy. And we shake our fist at God. And even when we were considered his enemies, what's it tell us? Christ died for us. With that mentality, Think about the relationships in our lives. Now it just got uncomfortable, didn't it? Those people that we don't care for, the people that maybe just are a little bit of a pain in the butt. Those people that we would look at and they go, whew, we do not like them. If we're going to become little Jesuses, what does that mean? Oh, we become the reconcilers. Not just so we have a friendship but we take Jesus to that relationship. We show them what is possible so that they can experience that new creation, so that they don't have to be defined by what they do, successes and failures and, and, and reputation, that they can understand what it's like and what it means to be new creation. We become little Jesuses reaching out to those around us. But I need you to understand all that we're talking about here has a prerequisite because it's kind of one of these if-then statements. If in Christ. Did you catch that part? That's the critical piece of this that we have to understand. This isn't just if good religious works, the new creation. If church attendance, new creation. If in Christ. And that's the rub sometimes, because when Jesus came, when Jesus did what he did, it wasn't to do good religious deeds. It was to become our Savior and Lord. It was to establish the new kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, where he rules and reigns. And so in order for us to be in Christ, what it requires is we can't continue to exist in our realm, in our kingdom. We have to be willing to step out and into and under the authority of King Jesus and surrender and lay down to him. And we want new creation. Those things sound really good to me. 
But sometimes what we don't want is the in Christ part. And that's the critical piece. It doesn't happen without being in Christ. We have to understand that. Now, when we talk about personal renewal, the one thing I want you to understand is that there's kind of a a two-sided coin here that we have to understand. When we talk about coming to faith, it is a work of God in our life. He initiates faith and we come to him. But when we talk about sanctification, another good churchy word, growth and renewal in Christ, there becomes a partnership where we work with the Holy Spirit together to see that transformation take place. God doesn't just go, done. We cooperate with the work of the Spirit in our lives. And what must be a part of this is intentionality. We need to be intentional if we are going to see this renewal continue to take place. Yes, we can step into the kingdom and that new creation is come, but then we work with God to see that come to its fullness. Because let's just be fair and honest, there's a lot of baggage that we step into that kingdom with. And we got to be willing to identify some baggage and set some things down and surrender them to God. So as we think about the intentionality of working with God, the question for us this year is, what are you going to do to work with God in your personal renewal in 2022? What are you going to do? Because if we don't have an idea, if we don't have a plan, I'm going to be the first to tell you it doesn't happen. But as a church, we want to encourage you. We want to support you and love you through this. And so one of the things we want to encourage you to do today is to to join us for the next 21 days on a little Bible reading plan. Now, you may think, well, this is silly. Yeah, maybe. But I want to see what will happen if all of us commit for the next 21 days to reading through the same scripture and little devotional thoughts And then sharing those things with one another. Maybe you find somebody in the room to text or call. Or maybe you join the Ashworth Church Online Facebook group and you post some thoughts there. What happens when we take this and move it? So right now you're allowed to get your phones out if you want to. And and if you don't have the Bible app on your phone from YouVersion, go ahead and get it. And then we're going, here's the reading plan. And we'll we'll post this this afternoon. You go to ashworth.church slash 2022 all things new, and it'll take you to a 21-day Bible reading plan. We can connect with one another and become friends with one another, and it'll tell us how each other are doing. It's great. We're not doing this to heap guilt on you. We're not doing this. It's an encouraging thing. And if you miss a day, nobody's going to call you and say, hey, sinner, get back to that reading plan. No, it's encouraging. You know, because we all can recognize this too, that guilt doesn't motivate us very well, does it? Not in the right way, but love will. And encouragement will get us where we want to go. So will you join us in the next 21 days, starting tomorrow? And let's read and figure out what God wants to do in and through us in 2022. And let's start doing the things that can help us be who God created us to be. Can we do that? I think we can. Can I tell you something? You're a new creation. You're not bound by those things in your past. You're not defined by anything except what Jesus says you are. You in Christ, you're a new creation. Let's pray.